So the, the neoadjuvant paradigm is one that's coming. You do really need to have a lot of humor so that we know that you're a stage three. Some, some patients, we don't really, we can't tell if they have lymph nodes involved and therefore they go directly to surgery and that's appropriate. Uh, I did want to say that the Europeans are running Nadina, but also the uh, Americans are running it. MD Anderson will be doing sure. Nadina shortly, as will the Angelus Clinic, a, a plug for the Angelus Clinic um, as we move forward and a couple of other sites in the United States. So uh, it's a good transition when you start talking about neoadjuvant therapy because this is now transitioning into the surgical oncologist portion of this meeting. So uh, neoadjuvant therapy is not taking the surgery away from the surgeon. It's just helping to understand uh, how to best take care of patients. One of the most amazing thing that we're going to get from neoadjuvant therapy is data, data from tissues. How were the tissues before? What did our treatment do for them later? Who responded? Who didn't? And then even before someone sees a surgeon or sees an oncologist, the pathologist can help us to say what kind of pathway they really need. Uh, so that transitions well into my discussion about Dr. Mark Ferries. And Dr. Ferries and I have uh, been together uh, for almost a decade and a half. And, and truly it's, it's a melding of surgical and medical oncology because a lot of this, you feel like uh, the medical oncologists are pulling the surgeons into it, but it's truly the opposite. And Mark has been wonderful in educating the medical oncologists about why these things are so important and forcing us to bring these therapies on and build these therapies into our programs specifically here. It's harder to build these programs. It has many moving parts, uh, but Mark's a taskmaster and I'm very afraid of letting him down. But I hope that everyone in their, in their career and their, in their jobs finds a, a partner like Dr. Ferries. Um, when I thought about who would talk about teletherapy, I realized that uh, Dr. Ferries had, has run a TIL program even before they became, you know, in vogue. He was, he was a uh, uh, icon in, in T cell therapy in this area in LA because even before others were doing it, he was doing it uh, almost uh, with his sheer energy. So uh, I'm going to ask that energy to get up here and and talk to us about uh, till therapy. All right, thanks very much. Um, yeah, Dr. Patel mentioned that uh, it's MD Anderson's 80th anniversary, which is a credible coincidence because Dr. Hamid and I started working together 80 years ago exactly <laughs> today as well. So it's tremendous. Um, but thank you for being here. Thanks for everybody joining online. Um, so my job is to tell you about uh, TIL therapy, which is coming on strong. Um, and the first task part of that is what is TIL therapy? Uh, and uh, TIL is, uh, stands for tumor infiltrating lymphocytes. Um, and uh, it may or may not be evident, but so many of the things you're hearing about today center in one way or another on lymphocytes, uh, white blood cells. So that's a lymphocyte. Um, and it is in many ways the key to the effectiveness, not only of TIL therapy, but a lot of the other therapies um, that you've heard of. It's not the only part of the immune system, uh, and, there, and there are proponents for a lot of other, for B cells and macrophages and other things, but, uh, uh, but they have taken the lead in the last uh, few decades. So, um, so what do we talk about? Why, why do we think the immune system can uh, fight cancer? Um, and uh, how do the lymphocytes do this? Um, and then making this work in terms of overcoming resistance uh, that tumors can have to immune attack. Um, and um, how can we uh, essentially manufacture an immune response uh, for patients who need it? Um, and then what's on the horizon? So uh, we know that um, uh, uh, the immune system can recognize uh, an attack 
melanoma cells and other tumor types. Um, and we know that, let's see, my, uh, okay, oh, my letters are not there, but that's all right. So um, this is just a, um, a microscopic image of a melanoma. And the big uh, pink cells on the top are melanoma cells and the small round blue cells at the bottom are lymphocytes, these white blood cells. Um, and this is before any treatment. This is just a, a biopsy basically that a patient had of a melanoma on the skin. Um, and what it tells us is that uh, somehow the body on its own has recognized these cells as abnormal and they have mounted this response and these cells, which would not normally be there, the lymphocytes, are working their way in, uh, in the hopes of uh, attacking those abnormal cells and getting rid of them. Um, and unfortunately, they're not uh, totally successful in doing that all the time. But this is a, is a real indication that this is a natural phenomenon that we may be able to take advantage of. Um, and so this goes way back uh, in terms of using this immune response uh, to a guy named William, William Coley, uh, who was a surgeon in New York at the uh, end of the 19th century. And um, he noted that a few patients that had uh, tumors, if those tumors got infected, in some instances, the tumors then went away. Um, and so what he thought was, well, why don't we introduce some products of this infection to uh, the tumors and see if they'll go away with that. And indeed, he had many examples where that actually happened. Um, they injected bacterial toxins into tumors and they dosed to how much they were supposed to give by uh, when the patient had a fever of 102. Um, that was enough. Um, but it was difficult to reproduce and the science wasn't there. And so it sort of fell by the wayside as chemotherapy and radiation came along. Um, and uh, so um, we have used similar uh, techniques uh, in using immune uh, treatments even before this raft of new great medications that, uh, that came along. Um, and so we used to inject uh, tumors like this with something called BCG, which is a TB vaccine. Um, and in this particular patient, uh, we also applied a topical cream called Aldera to it in, the, in together with the, uh, the um, uh, BCG injections. And over a series of uh, a number of weeks, uh, the tumor all went away. Um, and he had no side effects and, uh, he was in his nineties at the time and, uh, went on to die of something else a number of years later. Um, so we've known that this can work. Um, the thing that we love about, one of the things that we love about immune therapies is how durable the response can be. Um, and so, um, this is a very old study of one of the original immune therapies called interleukin-2. And although the response rates to interleukin-2 are not very high, the people that get a response uh, can get a response that lasts forever. Um, and so the important aspect of this survival curve, and this is a curve where as, uh, as people die, the curve drops down, you see that uh, after a bit of time, the curves are flat uh, and they never drop down again, meaning uh, once you've achieved this response, it can last uh, with you forever because you carry your immune system with you forever. Um, and so the situation has changed from the old IL-2 days. Uh, this is another version of, uh, of that slide that Dr. Car Carvajal had. Um, and what you can see is we had almost nothing for a very long time. And then there's been this explosion of new drugs, uh, effective drugs, uh, much more than what we had before. And all the things that are in blue and the things that are in white there are immune-based treatments. And so it's a very different world uh, to what we had before in terms of the number of options. Uh, but one thing that has been consistent with these immune therapies is this flat curve. Uh, so ipilimumab here, um, you can see that after a couple of years, the curve is flat and over many years, then it never drops down again. This is a summary of some of those neoadjuvant studies uh, Dr. Patel was talking about, flat curves then again, uh, at least in terms of early follow-up. So that's why we love, uh, one of the reasons why we love immune therapies. So how does all this work? I have no idea, right? I'm just a surgeon. So the smart people you'll hear from later and they may explain it to you, but this is my simplistic cartoon understanding of some of these things. So if you have a melanoma, there are antigens, there are targets uh, for the immune system that uh, are in the melanoma and either released on its own or when the melanoma dies, uh, these antigens are released or exposed and this is about potential targets for the immune system to recognize an attack. Um, and then there are um, what are called antigen presenting cells that take up those antigens. Um, those cells can then mature into things that are um, able to present 
those targets to um, the lymphocytes. So the lymphocytes then can see the targets, get energized to go off and kill the melanoma. And the cycle hopefully then continues. Um, and the cycle can be influenced at a number of spots uh, with treatments that we can uh, impose and with other components of the immune system. So there can be helper uh, lymphocytes that help this response go. There can be regulatory cells that block it. Um, and and the, hopes is, uh, the hope is that these little blue lymphocytes will go kill the big tumor cells and then move on and kill more tumor cells. Um, and it's often talked about as uh, sort of like driving a car uh, the components of this immune system. Um, uh, and so what are those components? Well, you can think of uh, this um, energi energi energizing of the um, antigen presenting cells as sort of the ignition switch, right? Uh, it, when we see danger, the immune system is turned on and then we produce these immune responses. Um, you can think about um, these things on the lymphocytes, uh, T cell receptors, as kind of a steering wheel, it tells the lymphocyte what it's supposed to attack. It identifies these targets. Um, and you can think about um, this interaction between uh, the immune cells and the melanoma cells as something that might have uh, things that step on the gas or that step on the brakes. Um, and so you can have um, helper cells, regulatory cells. You can have uh, these blockers, CTLA-4 and PD-1, that block the ability of these cells, uh, these responses to be generated and other things that can advance it or, or put, put uh, gas on it. Um, and so these have then uh, enabled us, uh, enabled many people to develop uh, some of these therapies, uh, which you know about. So for example, um, uh, uh, one of the breaks is uh, CTLA-4. And how does that work? So if you have an antigen presenting cell and you have a lymphocyte, uh, the normal way that these two things interact is the lymphocyte comes up and the antigen presenting cell shows it a target um, in a very specific sort of context. Um, and then there are co-signals, um, uh, in this case, CD28 that is on the lymphocyte. And when these two things come together with the target, uh, it turns that lymphocyte on and then the lymphocyte goes off to kill the stuff it's supposed to kill. Eventually, the lymphocyte may come back into contact with that antigen presenting cell. And now at this point, they've lost that CD28 that turned them on, and they've gained something called CTLA-4 that turns them off. And so that lymphocyte is turned off. This is kind of like a parking brake. Um, and uh, so ipilimumab, what it does is it keeps this from happening and releases this brake. The other version of this is sort of the foot brake. Um, and so this is the PD-1-based drugs. And here it's an interaction between a lymphocyte and a tumor cell and the same uh, target uh, receptor interaction uh, that would uh, tell the lymphocyte this is something that has a target we're interested in, uh, but there can be this interaction between PD-1 and PD-L1 on the two cells that then says, hey, yeah, no, no, don't, don't attack this cell, leave it alone, and it shuts that lymphocyte off. So these, all these PD-1 drugs that you know about um, work right here and keep that from happening. Um, and, uh, and, and there are not just those two points that we have interest in, in affecting how these, uh, the, the treatments work. Um, in fact, there are many points along this relatively complex cycle at which we can potentially intervene and help move things in the right direction. So we can kill more cells with radiation, with something called TVEC that may, you may know about an injected uh, treatment like the BCG. Uh, we can help turn on the, get, the, turn on the uh, ignition switch uh, with things that activate those antigen presenting cells, vaccines, those sorts of things. You can pour gas on it with interleukin-2, um, and there are lots of other places along the way uh, that we can uh, potentially have drugs that would help with this response. And so um, the question uh, for Simple Minded Me is, you know, is this really like driving a car uh, since it's a little bit more complex? And the answer is no, it's probably more like driving a space shuttle. Uh, so um, this is where all this excitement comes from that we have um, and where all these trials that you've heard about with different agents and different drugs uh, come along. So I'm not really supposed to be talking about any of that. I'm supposed to be talking about tumor infiltrating lymphocytes. Um, and so uh, back to T cells, uh, it's not this complex thing where we have to be flying the ship uh, as it's moving through this thing. Basically, what we do is we create uh, these uh, lymphocytes in the lab and then release them uh, to go off and do their thing uh, without us uh, necessarily having to intervene in the same way. So more like a cruise missile. 
Um, so how does this work? Um, we know already that uh, lymphocytes that are in the body can recognize and infiltrate into uh, tumors um, naturally on their own, uh, part of the body's normal immune defense. And what we can do surgically is take out uh, a tumor and uh, bring it into the lab where then we can put it into uh, conditions where we can see that it has lymphocytes in it. You can identify them with special stains that really highlight them. Uh, but we can put those uh, pieces of tumor into culture conditions that then allow the lymphocytes to have an advantage. Uh, and they grow up and proliferate. Uh, eventually, they kill the tumor that's in the, uh, in the wells and the culture in the lab. And then we can take those lymphocytes that have grown out and test them against tumor targets um, and see which of these uh, uh, subcultures of cells actually kill those uh, tumor targets or react to them uh, in the lab. Uh, and then the ones that react, we can put through uh, what's called a rapid, ex a rapid expansion protocol. Uh, we've used these uh, special gas permeabilized uh, uh, flasks, but it really allows you to uh, uh, magnify the number of these cells thousands of times uh, the point where you have billions of these anti-melanoma lymphocytes that then you can give back. Uh, so you take those and you give them back uh, through an IV uh, that go into the patient and then they make their way around the body, hopefully to find any melanoma and kill it. Um, there are special conditions that have to apply for when these treatments are given. So one is you have to get rid of many, most of the lymphocytes that are in that patient uh, before you give these cells back, essentially to create space uh, for those cells then to occupy uh, when they go in. So there's chemotherapy that's given to do that before the cells are given. And then this interleukin-2, which is a white blood cell growth factor, is given uh, to help support these lymphocytes uh, once they're infused and help them grow and proliferate. And those are actually the toxic parts of this treatment uh, and what make it so challenging. Uh, the lymphodepletion is a little bit toxic and the uh, interleukin-2 can be quite toxic. So not every patient is eligible or is a candidate to tolerate this, at least as it's given in the standard way. Um, but does it work? Uh, we know it works. Uh, so uh, uh, Dr. Rosenberg at the National Cancer Institute has been the pioneer, has been the uh, patron saint of this for many, many years. Um, and they've shown repeatedly that it can work. So the tumors disappear, they disappear, they disappear um, in patients that respond to this therapy. Um, but it has always been thought, or it was thought for many years that this couldn't be done outside of the NCI, a uh, very specialized center. So this is Google, Google Earth view of the NCI. Uh, it's a small city, right? Um, uh, there's another place that um, you may have heard of, uh, again, called MD Anderson, also a small city. So this is the kind of place where this, this stuff was done uh, because they had these uh, considerable resources and specialists to be able to do that. Um, but it actually doesn't take a city, uh, it takes a village uh, to do this. And Dr. Hamid and I worked together on a protocol that we had um, to be able to do this in our own lab. So uh, um, a clean room and uh, trained personnel to be able to process and grow these cells. And we we're able to then produce these, um, uh, these lymphocytes to be used for therapy, but it's a heavy lift. Um, and so um, it's not something every center could do. Um, and what we are gonna need to rely on then to make this broadly available are our partners in industry. Um, and so there are, all my colors are totally messed up anyway. Um, so there are um, uh, now a number of industry partners who are developing commercialized ways of using this same technique to treat patients with adoptive immunotherapy. Uh, so this is, these are the results of a, a recent trial um, that uh, we, we heard the, the news about and you're not gonna be able to see any words. So I'll just tell you, um, that this trial included patients who had failed previous standard therapies, the PD-1 drugs, 100% of the patients that had PD-1 drugs, most of the patients that had uh, the ipilimumab, CTLA-4 uh, type drugs, many of them had also had the BRAF and MEK inhibitors. So these are patients who had demonstrated an ability to grow through our standard therapies. Um, and what they found was over a third of the patients had objective responses uh, to TIL infusions. Um, and actually the percentage of people that benefit is probably higher than that. Um, as, as you'll see, it did still require the lymphodepletion. It did still require the interleukin two, um, but the patients, oh, there's the words, um, but the patients did, uh, did really well. Um, and so just to 
show you these uh, the waterfall plot. And again, each of the bars represents a, patient's in, a patient in the study. And if the bar goes up, their tumor grew. And if the bar goes down, the tumor shrank. And you can see the vast majority of, had their, of them had their tumors get smaller with therapy. And then again, this flat curve. So the durability, uh, they have not yet reached the halfway point in terms of people progressing bad responses. Um, so how can we make it better? Uh, one problem we face is we can't always generate cells that identify and re respond, at least in a way we can uh, measure uh, attacking tumor targets. Um, and so can we program this to happen? Um, and there are potential ways to do this actually just using lymphocytes that are taken out of the peripheral blood. Um, and they can be genetically modified so that they can um, identify and attack and destroy cancer cells. Um, and there are a couple of ways this can be done. Uh, one is with modification of this T cell receptor, the steering wheel, right? Uh, you can insert into these cells your own steering wheel, your own navigation, uh, and give them a, a receptor that is specific for a melanoma target. You can also uh, have a, what's called a chimeric antigen receptor cell, a CAR T cell, uh, where you've inserted a gene, which is something more akin to an antibody that's on the surface of the cell rather than a T cell receptor um, and, uh, and convert it into a, a weapon that way. And uh, they have advantages and disadvantages, these two modified uh, T cells. One nice thing about the T cell receptor uh, strategy is you can identify things that are abnormal inside the cell because the way our cells work is we present little things on the surface of our cell that tell that the immune system, what's going on on the inside. And so if there are mutations that are only present on the inside of the cell, you can still react to them uh, with this sort of technique. The uh, CAR T cells uh, react to things that are presented on the surface. So you have to have a surface target and they've mainly been used now for hematologic malignancies, um, yeah, but uh, are now standard therapies in hematologic malignancies. Um, so the transgenic T cell receptors, there have been a few studies in melanoma of that. And this just shows the number of lymphocytes that are infused after they uh, are put in and they can grow actually after they're put in, the numbers go up for a while and then come down again. And they did see in this uh, study that uh, many of the patients had um, indications of response on their um, x-rays, their PET scans got cold, um, uh, which indicated that they were having some sort of response. Unfortunately, it wasn't really durable for the patients in this study, um, and presumably because they just had a very small number of targets that they were going for, and maybe the tumors became uh, resistant or got rid of those targets. Um, but some hints that it, it may be effective. And then the CAR-T, again, mainly used for uh, lymphomas, leukemias, where the, this gene is inserted, and, um, and then they can see these indications of response. Uh, their bone marrow is then normalized with time, and this on flow cytometry that enables you to identify the cancer cells on blood, all the cancer cells, which you see here, go away after these cells are infused. Um, it can get even more complicated, so you can take a tumor out, you can do whole exome sequencing, identify all the mutations that are expressed in the cell, uh, predict what their uh, mutations and the antigens that would come for that would be, um, and then find lymphocytes that react to those neoantigens and then give those cells back. Um, so we can make it even more complicated and there's great things to come. So new directions and open questions. Um, can we use TIL for other tumor types? And it looks like we probably can, lung cancer, cervical cancer, maybe ovarian cancer or some breast cancer. So we'll see if it can be uh, uh, distributed to those. How much of this lymphodepletion do you really need? Uh, can you do it in a more gentle way? How much IL-2 do you need? That's a really critical question in terms of opening this up to more patients. Um, how do you pick the best lymphocytes? And there are a number of companies that are working on ways of uh, making better till um, for use in the clinic. And how do we grow them? You know, how do you make them better so that they're more effective once we give them back? So more to come. Uh, I want to thank my uh, partner in crime. Uh, I've been together with him for a long time uh, and look forward to many more years to come with him. And really critically important for all of this are all of the other people that are here. Um, that are not uh, given talks here today. Uh, this is uh, them in their normal work uh, outfits. Um, but these are all the folks at the Angelus Clinic that make the infusion work, that make radiology work, that make the nursing work, uh, that coordinate all the appointments, um, all these things that have to happen to make all this possible. Those are the folks that make it happen. Um, and to all of you uh, who volunteer for clinical trials, uh, you make this possible as well. So thank you all very much.